What is the Lord saying to you? What is he speaking? Find out. So you can walk in the fullness of that season. Amen. Turn to Matthew chapter 10. That's very important for you to understand and know. You must understand your seasons. Here's the reason why. Some of us, God may be taking us through a season where we're losing everything. And we're frustrated, we're agitated. But yet we're still trying to gain everything. When God is saying, listen, stop being a hypocrite. Discern the time, discern the season that you're in. You must lose everything. Why? So that you can bear much more fruit. I got to cause you to lose some stuff. So that you can walk in the fullness of the next season that is in your life. Amen. You cannot take what you have now into the next season. Amen. God says I got to prune you. I got to cut so that you can bear much more fruit. Amen. So for some of us you are losing. And the reason why you are losing not because you are doing anything wrong. Amen. The reason why you are losing because it's that season for you to lose. So that you can walk into a season and gain and plant or pluck up what you planted for years to come. Are you hearing me? Amen. So don't be frustrated. Don't be agitated. Don't be discouraged. Understand that it's that season for you to lose. So that you might gain. Are you hearing me? Matthew chapter 10. Verses 34 through 39. You have it say amen. If you don't mind please stand for the reading of God's word. Now I'm going to give us some revelation today. Okay. You won't feel bad after today for some of us, for a lot of us, and how we've conducted ourselves in a good way. Some of us have conducted ourselves in a good way, but we felt bad about it. I'm going I'm to I'm help you to walk in a place of breakthrough in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Matthew 10, 34 through 39. You ready? Amen. I hope so. The Bible says, do not think. Now, this is Jesus talking, okay? I don't know what Bibles you have, but in most Bibles you have, you know, the black writing and then you have the red writing. The red writing is what Jesus has spoken, okay? So this is Jesus. He says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. Uh-oh. Jesus says, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Hmm. For I have come, now watch this now, listen to the words of Jesus. This is Jesus talking. He says, for I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies would be those of his own household. Okay. He who loves father or mother more than me, Jesus says, is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me, Jesus says, is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me, Jesus says, is not worthy of me. Let me continue. He who finds his life, Jesus says, will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake, Jesus says, will find it. Bow your heads. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the reading of your word, God. We thank you, God, for the content of your word. We thank you for the knowledge, the wisdom, and the understanding of your word. So, Father, we pray, even now, God, that our hearts and minds are ready to hear and receive your word, Jesus, today. Your word knows how to get to the very heart, the very core of each and every individual in this room, God. So, whatever you speak, I pray that every heart is ready to receive and accept what you have spoken to us. And we thank you, Father. It is in your precious name we pray. Let the church say amen. amen. You may be seated in Jesus' name. <coughs> My sermon title this morning, and it's going to be hard for some of y'all, because some of us don't like confrontation. We like to walk and be like Ahab. You know who Ahab and Jezebel is? Ahab was the one that was just passive. He let Jezebel do whatever it is he wanted to do, she wanted to do, and he was the king. Jezebel was that strong spirit, that manipulating spirit, that deceptive spirit, that dominating spirit. And a lot of us don't like confrontation where Christians are concerned. So I want you to look at your neighbor and I want you to declare my sermon title with boldness. 
But you got to be willing to walk in it. Amen? Amen. And look at your neighbor. If you don't have a neighbor, look to the person behind you and say, obedience, obedience. brings conflict. Brings conflict. Tell them again, obedience, obedience. Brings, conflict. brings conflict. Amen. 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 <laughs> hey, a lot of us, we don't like that conflict, do we? No, uh-uh. No, no. We don't like that. We like to compromise and say, you know, well, that's just who they are and how they are. So I ain't going to say nothing. Huh. We compromise so much where God is concerned. Jesus says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. He says, I did not come to bring peace. He says, I came to bring a sword. A sword. And this is, for me, when I read it, I had to read this thing several times. Because it's one of those scriptures, like I said, for me, it, it, it makes you, when I read it, it, it almost forces you to go deeper into your study. Because it sounds like a, a contradiction to what we already know where Jesus is concerned. Doesn't it? Here's what I'm saying by that. The popular perception of the world concerning Jesus is that he was a man of love who came to bring peace. Isn't that what we know about Jesus? That his message was peace on earth and peace through love. Jesus. We constantly reminded or reminded of the scripture, a child is born, a son is given, and he's going to be called the Prince of Peace. That's what the scripture says, right? In the Bible, the angels announced to the shepherds that Jesus would bring peace on earth and even the Jews had this expectation that when the Messiah came, Jesus, peace would come with him, but Jesus absolutely shatters that expectation. Shatters it. Colossians 1.20 says, he came to bring peace through the blood of his cross. And the apostles, according to Acts chapter 10.36, were preaching peace through Jesus Christ. So, shouldn't we expect then that he came to bring peace? According to scripture? Now go back to Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. Here again. He would be a prince of peace. Jesus. But look at Luke chapter 12 verse 51. Jesus said. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? He says I tell you not at all. Not at all. He says but rather division. Uh oh. Division. Do you suppose that I came to bring peace on earth? He says, no, not at all. But rather, Jesus says, the vision. Now, let's talk about that for a little bit because I know I got your attention now. <laughs> I want to bring clarification because, yes, Jesus is peace. And yes, he does bring peace. But hear this. But there are some areas where there will be no peace and Jesus is at the very core, at the very center of it. Are you hearing me? So now, a very quick background so I can lay a foundation where we are in, in, in Matthew. We're toward the end of the ministry of Jesus. Remember, he only had ministry for three years. Okay, three years. Three years of ministry. Jesus is now headed to the cross. The unbelief and rejection of Israel is fixed, it's set. The religious leaders have rejected him and already are plotting to kill Jesus. This is where we are. The people will join in screaming for his blood, but they have already been convinced for the most part that Jesus does what he does by the power of Satan. It's already been convinced, already done. And therefore giving up their opportunity for peace. And this is a turning point for Matthew chapter 10 verse 34 when Jesus says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword, says the Lord. Flip over to Luke chapter 12, verse 49, real quick. Or turn me down just a little bit, just a little bit. Luke chapter 12, verse, verse 49, Jesus says, now we're talking about what Jesus is saying, okay? He says, I came to send fire on earth. And how 
I wish it were already kindled. Now, Luke chapter 12 and Matthew chapter 10 are cross reference. Okay? They basically say the same thing. Cross reference. Matthew chapter 10 and Luke chapter 12. Cross reference. He says, I came to send fire on the earth. And how I wish it were already kindled. Jesus starts out with the words. Watch this now. He says, I have come. Okay? I have come or I came to. Now, these words reveal his mission. He's telling you what he has come to do. It's a phrase by which he summarizes why he is here on this earth. It's a phrase used throughout the Bible. I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. I have come to not violate the law, but to what? Fulfill the law. I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. I have come to be a light. So Jesus repeats often why he has come. Often. He has come to give life. He came to give light. He came to bring peace. He came to seek and he came to save. But if you don't accept the things he offers, he has come to what? Send fire. Are you hearing me? Now what is fire? Fire is a picture of judgment. So the Jews believe, now watch this, that when Jesus comes, the fire will fall on the Gentiles, the unsaved, the hypocrites, okay? And the peace will come upon them, Christians. You think that the fire, the judgment won't come upon you because you're saved. You think that the fire and the judgment just going to come upon those that are not saved. You're just like those hypocrites back in the Bible days. John 9 39 says, For judgment I have come into the world. Here we go again. You hear the words? I have come. For what? For judgment I have come. Where? Into this world. That those, watch it, here's what's powerful. Listen to the word. Jesus talking again. He says that those who do not see may see. That those who do not see may see. Now what? Watch this. He said, and that those who see may be blind. Hmm. hmm. That those who do not see may see. And that those who see may be blind. So his judgment is a two-way street. His judgment is it saves and it's a judgment that also condemns. Two-sided. He says, I have come to bring light. I have come to seek and save. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. He says, but I have, all, I have also come to send fire. I have also come to send judgment, says the Lord. Now flip over back to Matthew chapter 10. Y'all like to hear them onion skins go back and forth. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. You ready? You got the background. You know where, where we are right now, okay? Jesus says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace. Jesus says, but a sword. But a sword. Now what is the nature of a sword? What is the nature? A sword is made to cut things. To divide things in two pieces or several pieces. So the word for sword here brings that cutting and cleaving action to mind. Follow me. Verses 35 and 36 says, For I have come, there go those words again, revealing his mission, to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. That's the new King James Version. Listen to the King James Version. For I have come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Now watch this. The words set and variance have the same Greek meaning, which is to cut apart, to divide in two. So Jesus said, I have come, what? To cut a man totally off from his father. Are you hearing me? And a daughter from her mother. 
Jesus then extends it from the immediate family to the family by marriage. He says, I have come to divide into the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Hmm. And we get to the nitty-gritty now. Why? Because this is the worst possible expression. The worst. Because it now gets into your home. Where you have the most meaningful relationships. Covenant relationships. And so what Jesus is implying here is this. If you're true to him, you'll be willing to create a division in your home which goes against the grain of your nature. Because your home is the place you want peace. That's the place you want to keep intimacy. Those are the people you love the most. You don't want to be at odds with them, but you will be true when you commit yourself to Jesus with such commitment to his lordship that even if it breaks or fractures your home, you're willing to pay the price. Lord. Are you hearing me? Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. This is the worst cutting. The worst cutting that occurs. Why am I saying it's the worst cutting? Because it's not so bad when you're at odds with your neighbor. Come on. Is it? You ain't got to see that person every day. You don't have to live with that person. You may see that person for a minute and then you're gone. It's not so bad. When you're at odds with your boss. I know you're with that person eight hours a day, but eventually you do get to leave that person. <laughs> it's not so bad when you're at odds with your friend, is it? But when it gets into the family, and your commitment, and your commitment to Jesus means that you're set at variance or divided against your family, that's where it really begins to rub. Mm -hmm. It goes against the affection of your love for them. Are you hearing me? And you must understand that being a Christian, following Jesus, may mean that you have to create a division in your own home. My God. Mm. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But that's the mark of a true follower of Christ. That's the mark of a true follower. You're not going to hang on. Watch this. To those relationships to the extent that you will not commit yourself to the Lordship of Jesus. My God. Are you hearing me? Can I go further? Remember Cain and Abel? Did you notice that the sword fell between the two of them? Cain was an unrighteous man and the splitting apart was so great that Cain couldn't stand it and what did he do? He murdered his brother. We talking about now division in the home. David's wife despised him because of his radical praise and worship where God was concerned. Are you hearing me? Luke 12 says, Father will be divided against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. Mother, mother in law against her daughter in law, and daughter in law against her mother in law. Now, watch this now. Yes, you love your family 100%. So don't, get, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. You love your family, you love your children, you love your parents, you love your husband, you love your wife, you love those who have become family as a result of marriage, but your commitment to Jesus. If you're true to him, it's so deep and so profound that you will say no to those which are the normal extensions of your affection for the cause of Christ if need be. What am I saying? Nobody should be able to separate you from the love of Christ. Nobody should be able to separate you from what God has called you and is telling you to do. Nobody should. Hmm. What are you saying, Pastor? That's a tough, just tough, a, a tough, a tough pill to swallow right there. That's my wife. That's my husband. Hmm. That's my son. That's my daughter. Listen. When you walk on the road, this is powerful. That leads to following Jesus, 
and your family member walks on the road that leads to destruction, you may walk together for a time, but eventually your paths will part ways. Jesus. And those people, watch this, will be surprised when you don't join them in the same behavior. Jesus. But for the time, listen, for you, for you, the time has passed for doing or behaving the way they want you to. That time is gone. Your commitment to live for the rest of your life, no longer for human passion, but for the will of God, will divide from father, will divide you from father, from son, from mother, from daughter. If you walk in the will of God, and you're connected to somebody that doesn't, and you love that person, it will eventually divide you from that. Are you hearing me? Divide you from those outside the immediate family. It'll divide you from your husband. It'll divide you from your wife. It'll divide you from your kids. It'll divide you from everybody that is within the, in, in the house. And because now that you're married, now you have daughter-in-laws and you have mother-in-law and you have sisters, it'll divide you from all of that too. What am I saying? If Jesus has not separated you from someone in your life, I question whether or not you truly follow him. Jesus. Hmm. Jesus. What am I saying? Don't miss what I'm saying. Now, someone doesn't imply just family, but relationships in general. In other words, because of your walk with Jesus and being obedient to him, if there hasn't been a cutting or dividing in two, you may want to evaluate your walk with Jesus. Hmm. Saints of God. Are you hear me? And it's especially tough when it's your family. It's extremely tough when it's your family. Extremely. Are you following me? Yes. And with all that said, your goal must never be to break the ties of your family. Your goal, your goal, okay, hear the words, your goal should never be to break the ties of your family. But when your family don't obey the word of God, call to repent and they don't repent and they don't believe, you must not be an accomplice to what they choose to do. And if they oppose you because you obey God, you must continue to obey God rather than man, even if it costs you the relationship with your family. Jesus. Are you hearing me? Some of y'all right there, right now, aren't you? You either have experienced or you are experiencing that division between you and your family. Between you and friends. That relationship with those people. Is it strained? Some of those relationships with those aunts and cousins and different people in the family. Have actually been severed. Hasn't it? Why? Hear this. Why? Because the Christian you makes them uncomfortable. That's right. That's right. That's it. And watch this. Not everyone is as committed as you are. So you may be experiencing division even from other Christians who are not totally sold out to following Jesus, no matter the cost. Hmm. You got other brothers and sisters in the Christ that can't get with you because you're being obedient to what God is telling you to do. And, they, and because they're Christians, but they have a carnal mindset, to them it don't make sense for you to walk out the boat and walk on water. <laughs> They can't get with it. So what they try to do is give you logic and reason from a natural standpoint. Well, you, you, you don't need to do this because you don't have this in place. From my understanding, that is not faith. Hmm. God said don't do this. But because family can't get with it and because you choose to obey God, they try to oppose you. Hmm. It's going to cause that division. Are you understanding? Yes. And this is what Jesus is saying. Right here. To truly follow him and walk in his ways. 
you will not or will not it will not always bring peace in some cases it will bring division no matter who the person or people are in your life that's what Jesus is saying there are things that God will require of you that won't make sense to others and the result will lead to what a sword not of man but of God that will cause division separating cutting mm. what am I saying I'm gonna make it plain I got to <sighs> you got husband walking one way you got wife walking one way. You got one trying to hear from God and be obedient, but the other one is not. So now you're in home, you're in a covenant relationship, but there's no peace. Why? There's a cutting that has taken place. Jesus. Are you hearing me? The Bible says that your enemies will be in your own household. Upon the same roof. You're trying to be obedient. You're trying to walk with God. But your son won't do right. Your daughter won't act right. Wait, let, let, let's switch it. Your son and your daughter trying to be obedient to God. But mom and daddy. <laughs> Can I make it plain? They're trying to do right. That son is trying to do his best to follow what God is saying. That daughter is trying to do her best to follow what God is saying. But that carnal minded mom and daddy won't get out the way. And you find friction in the home. And now you're constantly at war. Because of your enemies. Be in your own household. So what am I saying? Part of the cause of following Jesus. Is that it forces you to make a decision. Forces you. Then here. Matthew 10. In our lives. The point is. You must make a choice. Between Jesus. And the people you love. And the things you care about. Let me say that again. You must make a choice. Between Jesus and the people you love. And the things you care about. Are you understanding? This is what is called. The Abraham test. Are you hearing me? You remember Abraham. Abraham. Remember when God called Abraham and said, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your only son, your son Isaac. The one that I told you, your wife who was 90 years old, 80 years old, that she was going to give birth to. The one that I told you, not only was she going to give birth to, but I told you to name him Isaac, that son. I told you what your son was going to do. I told you what was going to be birthed out of your son before your son was born. Take that son now that he's born and in his teenage years and offer it. Bring your son up to this mountain and offer your son up as a burnt, as, as a burnt sacrifice. Offer him up now. Kill him. Kill him, Abraham. Are you hearing me? Now watch this. Abraham was willing to do what God said for the sake of obedience to God even if it cost him his only beloved son. My God. Are you hearing me? He put God first no matter what. No matter what. My wife and I was watching CNN last night. And it hit us to our core. And they call it um, terror at the mall. It was called terror at the mall over in Kenya. Happened in 2013. This mall was packed full of people. And then all of a sudden, these gunmen just came and just started shooting up people. Just shooting them. Just for no apparent reason. Well, apparently, whatever country they came from, Kenya, the people of Kenya, whatever, had killed their, their husband, their wives, and their children. So they came for revenge. And they just started killing people, innocent people, just walked through the mall, just shooting people up. I mean, they were showing it because the cameras in the mall were just still running. I mean, they're showing people walking by and just shoot people in the head. I mean, they showing this on CNN. Just showing. And what really got us, and my wife had just asked me the question in regards to, you know, where Christ is concerned and, and, and dying. If somebody came to you and said, if you don't, 
confess Muslim, if you don't confess Allah, if you don't denounce Jesus. We had just had that conversation while we were watching it because that was the reason basically for all this killing. And they said, and these were Muslims now that was doing all the killing. And they, they would come to some people and he, they would ask the question, are you Muslim? Or Christian. No, they would say, are you Muslim? And the person would say, yeah, and they would let that person go. They heard one guy speaking or praying the Quran. And they said, you must be Muslim. Yeah. He said, this your white guy. Let him go. And they came to one lady. And she stood up. No, they let that guy go. And the lady stood up. She, the older lady. She said, older lady. She said, she said, I'm old and my legs are hurting. Can I leave? Looked at her and said, are you Muslim? And this is what was so powerful to me. Older lady. She said, I'm a Christian. And he shot her dead. Shot her dead. Shot her dead. She shot. He, she said that she was Christian. He shot her dead. Shot her dead. What am I saying? God calls us to make a decision, even in moments and times like that. She made a decision and it cost her her life. We won't make a decision because we don't want to lose that family member. We don't want to lose that daughter. We don't want to lose that son. We don't want to lose that family member. So we won't make the decision that God is telling us to make to get our priorities right to make him first. We won't make that decision. But here this woman is older, older lady. She made that decision and it cost her her life. So what am I saying to you? God wants you to put your priorities in place. Get your priorities right. Put him first above your career. Put him first above your comfort. Put him first above your personal hopes and dreams. Above yes, put him first your father. Put him above your mother. Put him above your son. Put him above your daughter. Make him first. Go to Isaiah chapter 1 verses 19 and 20. Isaiah says, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. He says, but if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That's the Bible. Remember Abraham? Abraham was willing and obedient to do the unthinkable. He was willing to do the unthinkable. How many of us would take our son if God says, bring your son and offer your son up, kill your son? How many of us would be willing to do that? How many? The only thing that Abraham remembered is what God told him about Isaac. That's why when he walked up, this is why you have to know what time, what season, what God is saying. Because there are times when God will test you in regards to what he has spoken to you 10 and 20 years ago. He spoke a word to Abraham about Isaac. And what Isaac was remembering as he walked up that mountain, and Isaac said, Daddy, I don't see fire and I don't see uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the word, the, uh, the offering. Abraham said, God will provide, provide the lamb for the burnt offering. God will provide it. Everything. Everything. And Abraham was willing to make that choice. To kill his son. He was willing to make that choice. To sacrifice his own family member. He was willing to make that choice where his family was concerned to walk in the place of obedience. How many of us in this room are willing to make that choice that it may cost you that family member? I mean, so if 
verses 34 through 36 of Matthew 10. And verses 51 through 53 of Luke 12. The division that is seen in these verses speaks towards several areas. First, there's a division which occurs within the family. Where the closest human bonds are to be found. Blood is thick in the water. Don't we say that all the time? Yeah. Blood is thick in the water. <laughs> hmm. But history, for all of us Bible scholars, has made it known that the gospel divides men and women, husband and wives, parents and children, for, the, for faith in Christ requires ultimate alliance to him. Ultimate. And notice now, the division that occurs in these verses reveals it all within where? The family. Hmm. But it also crosses lines of authority. <laughs> Fathers have authority over sons. And mothers have authority over daughters. So in obeying God rather than man, division will occur. It crosses the line of authority. Are you going to do what I tell you to do? Hmm. So here, in these verses, Matthew 10, Luke 12, Jesus uses an illustration to show that the divisions caused by the gospel go very deep, even to the separation of close family members. You hear me? Watch this. This is why I like Jesus so much. Because we have a misperception where Jesus is concerned. The fact I don't see nowhere, nowhere in the Bible that Jesus apologized for what he said. Nowhere did Jesus say, you know, I apologize for bringing a, a, a sword where your family is concerned. I apologize because of who I am, because of what I'm calling you to do, and because I'm the son of God. I apologize that it's going to cause you to be separate from your son. Nowhere in the Bible does Jesus apologize for that. That shows his exalted position because he's the eternal son of God. We must follow him even if it leads to family division because he's much more worthy of our alliance than even the closest earthly ties that we have. Are you hearing me? Now, for everybody in this room, of course, we should always strive for harmony in the family. Always. You strive for that. And we should never do anything personally offensive to or call to cause friction or separation. Should never do anything personal to cause that. We should love and honor our family members always. We should be kind and gracious to our family members, even if family members are offensive toward us. Amen. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> but if family members are offended by the gospel we believe. Then so be it. It's time out for Christians to stop being passive, lip wristed, bowing down because you don't want to offend somebody. Yeah, I'm going to call it out now. We walk around and we don't have any backbone. We walk around and we're passive because we don't want to hurt that person's feelings. So we're just to obey God so that this person can be comfortable. Where's the God in that? Where's the God in that? Where's the God in that? Where? Where? How many times did Jesus have to walk alone? For the sake of God. There was no better example than Jesus. Jesus hung on that cross. Here's a man. Here's a man. Who loves his mother. Loves his mother. Loves his mother. Hung on that cross. And he had to say I'm no longer your son. I'm no longer your son. He said the one sitting beside you. He's your son. Are you hearing me? He had to be willing. 
And it cost him. It cost him. Hung on the cross. Hung on the cross. And it cost him. Hung on the cross. Are you willing to hang on the cross? Even if it costs you that family member. Are you willing to hang on that cross? If it brings a little friction. Where the home is concerned. Are you going to waver and compromise? Or are you going to stand firm? Are you? Obedience will bring separation. Even where the closest earthly ties are concerned. God is telling you to do this. God is telling you to be here. God is saying to be in position. God is saying this is where I've called you. But mom and daddy. You don't want to hurt mom and daddy. You're trying to do. God is saying you do something. But you won't do it. Why? Because mom and daddy. Mom and daddy. God says, you're going to have to make a choice. Jesus. You're going to have to make a choice. That's why God said, do you realize I have come not to bring peace? He's warning us. When you walk in me, there's going to be division. Why? Because there's some folks in your family that you're close to, that you love with everything that's in your being, that won't get with what I'm telling you to do. And it's going to cause division. Come on, Pastor. Right. It's going to cause it. He hit every facet. Some of us, where he ain't talk about mama, he ain't talk about daddy, he said, in your own household. Mm -hmm. Under your roof. And then he went outside the house to your immediate family. So everybody you connected to, he says, it's going to cause division. So make a decision. What am I saying? The essence of Christianity is that loyalty to Jesus has to take precedence over the loyalties of family and friends. Amen. Are you understanding? Mm -hmm. But here's the disappointment of many Christians. And I'm closing. It is often those closest to you who have rejected your message and lifestyle in Christ, even to the point of betrayal. My God. The ones closest to you. The ones that are, you give your heart and soul to. And they oppose you. They rise up against you. Because all you're trying to do is follow Jesus. They call you religious names. All because you're trying to follow Jesus. They talk about you. Because what you're doing. What Jesus is telling you to do, in their mind, it don't make sense. Right. They don't understand that the Bible says there's a time and season for you to lose. So when they see you losing, I'm being personal right now. Right. When they see you losing, you're not doing your job. Mm -hmm. So they point the finger. And they attack your integrity and your character in Christ. They point the finger and they attack who you are. Why? Because in the natural, I'm not seeing anything. And because I'm not seeing anything or they're not seeing anything, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. So they attack you, they oppose. And I had people in my in the family rise up. And the very thing I put my heart and soul to. But the church ain't doing nothing. The church ain't doing no good. You need to do something else. The ones close. Oh yeah, it hurt. 
to my core. When it's been three years, the church has not grown. You're struggling, you're suffering, you're losing. To the very thing that God gave birth to, they talk about it. And say, you need to walk out and leave that baby. It will bring division. But you got to be willing to stand. Stand firm. Even if it costs you your family. To be obedient to Jesus. You got to be willing. It's going to cost you. They're going to oppose you. They're going to rise up against you. It will bring conflict. And it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. But even if it being. Or it cutting and hurting you to your core. You got to be steadfast. Unmovable. Always abounding. In the work of the Lord. That's what God is looking for. Put him first. And I'm going to close with this. By putting God first, you operate in the order of God. Are you hearing me? What do I mean, what do I mean by the order of God? You put God first. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit first. And for everybody that's married in this room and you have kids, then comes your wife, not your kids. So it's God first. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Your wife second. If you're married, then if you have kids, then your kids. And then it trickles down from there. Not God and then your kids. No. It's God, then your wife. You can't say leave, which you're going to keep my, my kids going to say, here. no. You're putting your kids first. No. You need to do everything possible to hold on to that thing. Don't make a decision based upon your kids. Because now you're putting your kids first and not God first. And your wife second. If you don't have kids, God first. Then comes your kids. I mean, if you don't have, if you're not married. Then, then comes your kids. And everything else follows suit. Get things in power. Get things in order. Get things in line. Get them in line. It's going to bring conflict. It's going to bring division. Because you're being obedient to what God said to do. Come on, stand to your feet. If you haven't experienced it, keep on living this life with Jesus by faith. And you will. I'm going to walk in testimony of it. It hurts. But you take it. You take it. It comes with the territory. So now that you have understanding that when it comes, it won't be such a blow because you understand why it has come. Are you hearing me?